a Menaki resident, and he's going to take us through the 89 year history of Menaki in and Lodge. So, welcome. Thanks very much, Liz. What a tough act to fall. <laughs> I'm not up here to tell jokes all day, but an incredible story, Phil. Thank you very much. It's an honor for me on behalf of my wife Shirley and Nancy Gates, who's my able assistant, uh, and the rest of our Menaki History Society team to be with you today on this auspicious occasion. When we first started to discuss with Lori uh, what subject of all the areas we are currently studying in the Menaki area of history would be strike the major chord with you, the audience, it was felt that uh, the multifaceted story, and I would say more a saga, of the Menaki Inn, and now Menaki Lodge, held the most interest. By way of introduction, I am a fourth generation cottager at Menaki, with our family cottage dating back from 1914. Uh, the boys built it just before they all went to war. Some didn't come home. And Nancy's roots actually go back to, uh, I was saying buried deep in the Menaki ground, but I think in the Menaki granite from 1907, her family cottage. So, so we've got deep core roots in this area. As well, uh, for two summers, I worked at Menaki Lodge in 66 and 67 as a resident pro at the golf course. I, I hope I didn't teach any of you how to play golf. <laughs> I hope. I will tell a quick story, if I may, to get started. Um, I had just bought a set of, for me, new Wilson Staffs, great set of golf clubs. I'm in the pro shop, I had taken the clubs up, put them on the first tee. Who's played Menaki here? Menaki course, okay. Put it up in the first tee under the big tree. So, can't wait to get out and play. All of a sudden there's a commotion. Down the back stairs out of the kitchen comes one of the cooks with a knife chasing the chef. <laughs> True story. They come roaring up the hill towards the first tee. The cook is yelling in some, accent, some language we don't know. The chef is big, big guy, barely able to stay ahead. Looks at my golf clubs. Yeah. <laughs> grabs this brand new four iron. Turns around and he starts playing with the, with the cook. The cook goes back up into the kitchen. The chef's running after him. They finally get up and we're up following them and the chef is swinging the four iron and finally hits, hits at, the, at the cook. Tink. Off went the head behind one of the big 5,000 pound cast iron stoves. We got the cook out of town that night on the next train. I wonder in 83 or 70s when they did the renovations and somebody found this golf head, figuring how did this thing get there? Many of us, as I said, either as residents or cottagers, worked at the lodge and formed lifelong friendships and several marriages. And many of who came to work there ended up staying and having their own cottages and businesses in the area. What a time, what a place, what characters, what stories. Can you put the house lights up for just one sec, please? Thank you. I want you to hold, keep your hands up. Who worked at the lodge over the years? Keep your hands up. Who has been in the lodge? The old, okay, keep your hands up. Who stayed at the lodge? Keep your hands up. Hands up, hands up. And who went to the brunch? Okay, well that's just about the group. Thank, thank you for the lights. Thank you. So, I'm sorry? Your mother worked there? I want to talk to you after about the stories. Whether your home or cottage is north or south of the CP mainline, the lodge has touched so many of our lives in its 89 years. My focus today will be from the coming of the railroad to Menaki, the development, or my mother would say the Menaki, the development of the Menaki Inn in 1914, through to the second and last devastating fire in October of 2003. A large story from then until now and into the future is still being written, even in the last week, and hopefully can be told with pride by a future storyteller. I hope we're able to educate and entertain you with a few photos, stories, little known facts, a few personal anecdotes, and a bit of factual, factual correction to long-held myths and beliefs. In my research, it became clear early on that this subject could take more than two presentations to properly cover. So let's get started. First one, 
There's the Menachean of 1914 on the screen. Um, unfortunately, to date, we have never seen a picture taken on the inside of the inn. It was built in 1914 and it went on until 1925, as I'll mention in a minute. We have zero pictures from inside the inn. So if any of you know of anyone who might have pictures pre-1925 fire, we'd love to talk to you. Next, please, Nance. I'll let you read this. Uh, we are researching um, the history of the area, both along the river, all the way from the Dolls up to White Dog. Stories, pictures, chronologies. We are working on a website. Uh, we do want to put a book together, I mean, that's a daunting effort, but we, that is one of our goals. We're currently on Facebook. This is a whole new technology for me. The Naki History Society. And we've got a great response, over 205 members, I think that's. And uh, people are posting pictures old brochures, both Benaki Lodge, Holtz Point, telling some stories, and uh, so I encourage you to look on that, uh, that Facebook site to start. If you have anything to share, uh, please do. Uh, next, please. Uh, two pictures that many of you are familiar with. The first one on the left is the dolls, and obviously you can see how low the water is there, and uh, the picture on the right, obviously, of White Dog Falls before the dam. Uh, for information, the dam was built in 58. First turbines came on in February of 58. Uh, in the old days, a lot of the old steamers were quite underpowered. The barges and the tugs that were pulling the, the, uh, the, the barges uh, up to build the National Transcontinental Railroad. Um, had, had no problem getting down, lots of trouble getting back. <laughs> and um, so often they had people and or horses on the shore pulling back up. Um, there's also several guests on a few trips where they would have to get off one of the Menaki Lodge launches downstream of the Dolls, walk a half mile overland with their suitcases, <laughs> and the second boat would be waiting at the top of the Dolls to take them into their, the Menaki Lodge dock that was in Rideout Bay. Um, the east channel of the Dolls was actually dredged. They originally were going to blast it out, but they ended up dredging it in 1949. But even as of two years ago, the high water we had then two years ago, it was still roaring through. White Dog, that's obviously, it still is the end of boating on the Winnipeg River going north, unless you're in a canoe. Uh, the dams, the dam was built between 55 and 58. Raised our water levels at Benaki about four feet. And it's still a popular fishing and picnic spot. Yes. Um, Winnipeg River, how historic can it possibly be? I don't need to go into the history, but it, it's the artery of our entire area. Um, please remember we are downstream from Lake of the Woods and from Kenora. Um, principal concerns for us obviously from the Winnipeg River and on the Winnipeg River are water quality, uh, stabilization of water levels, that'll be interesting to see how that continues to play out, and um, invasive species. Please, Nancy. Uh, indigenous people have been core of our community as they have been are, and are he, uh, here for you. Uh, both the major communities of the Dolls and the White Dog. Uh, many of the families, uh, indigenous families in the area have been instrumental in helping to operate commercial camps in the area, working at many of our cottages, selling product over, the, over many, many decades. And they're part of our fabric uh, since the arrival of the white settlers in uh, around 1900. Yes. Again, the fur trade, um, major east-west highway we know for transport of furs and goods, exploration, and, and also expeditions such as Wolseley, uh, heading out in 1870. Took him weeks, uh, then when he went out the next second time for the real rebellion, took him a matter of days on the CPR. Yes. Anyone know who this is? Skipper Holtz, Holtz Point. Quite a guy from Sweden. Well, we're very fortunate, and you'll see it on the Facebook, we're in, still in, in touch with uh, a great niece, I think, of his, who's produ produced a lot of pictures for us of Holtz. Uh, he was quite a bon vivant. Uh, he arrived about 1907, uh, so he was one of the first white men in, in the area. By then he knew the Grand Trunk Pacific, uh, the National Transcontinental was coming through Menaki, and so he decided to build a small lodge and then ended up building um, uh, Holtz Point a little bit later. Um, other names you'll remember and know from this area are the Munsters, the Reeds, the Charleswurst, Suffrons are all other early families. 
Um, the surveying of the actual town site of Menaki uh, at the Winnipeg River Crossing started in 1909. And by October of 1910, there were 376 lots for sale. They were going by tender. And uh, they were running about two bucks a foot, I think, on the frontage. So pretty good price. Yes. Here's a great picture of an unusual perspective of Holtz Point in 1925, uh, looking towards the bridge. And um, the major competitors, obviously, to, to Menaki Lodge were Holtz Point. And uh, Dr. Lauren mentioned earlier Pal Camp. Um, uh, Holtz was eventually taken over by the government as part of the takeover in the uh, early 70s. Back in the day, Menaki Lodge would be five bucks a day with meals at the start. Holtz Point was 350. Pal Camp, two bucks. Turkey dinner at Pala every Sunday night. I don't know how they did that. And but at Pala, if you wanted clean linen, you had to pay 50 cents a week. <laughs> so. A little difference in dynamics and approach. Holtz Point, unlike the Lodge, stayed open even in years when the Lodge was closed uh, during the war and during the Depression. Uh, unfortunately, Holtz Point burnt down by arson, proven by arson October 3rd, or August 3rd, 1989, while serving as a Menaki Lodge staff residence. I've been in Florida, Nancy's doing the PowerPoint, she snuck her cottage picture in before I got my cottage <laughs> picture in. So this is the Parker Cottage, thanks to her aunt Nora. Um, 1907 we think is probably the earliest the cottages that were being built in the Menaki area. Um, and until the Grand Trunk Pacific came through uh, a few years later, all the travel was from Rideout Bay by steamers down the Winnipeg River and back. And we're very fortunate as we're telling this history of the Menaki area that so many of our residents and so many of us as cottagers are fourth, and I think like here in Lake of the Woods, fourth and even some fifth generation families. So we're moving away from a factually based history and I'm quite happy to get stories that have some fact and lots of entertainment value in them. This is the, sorry, the building of the, uh, let me take it away, the, uh, the pylons for the, uh, uh, Grand, Grand Trunk Pacific uh, National Transcontinental Railroad. Um, the reason it was built here because it was the shortest. That way a bit more. Uh, the shortest distance across the water had very easy grades, both coming and leaving. Uh, the Grand Trunk Pacific had much better grades than the CPR, both here, the prairies, in particular through the Rockies. Um, late into 1905, the government surveys selected Whitefish Point, which became Willet, which became Hodgkin's Land, which became Winnipeg River Crossing, which became Yanaki in 1911. There were three other locations actively surveyed and looked at. One was the Kenora Board of Trade pushing to be parallel to the CPR and come through Kenora. That was option one. Option two was across at the Dolls. And the third, which was surveyed actively by the Grand Trunk Pacific surveyors in 03-04, was up at White Dock. It was going to come up along the south shore of the English River and Lac Sewell as it headed east. The government stepped in, resurveyed, and ended up coming across the Menaki. Regular Menaki service by train started in June of 1911. That's this is the Menaki Bridge, a uh, picture that Nancy took looking back uh, upstream. Uh, there was mention earlier about the Darlington Bridge and there was a section that could open. That section on the left was originally designed to be a lift bridge in case the big steamers were coming down and they would have to lift and it never happened that way. Um, I don't know if the name Charles Melville Hayes rings a bell to anybody. You've heard of Melville, Saskatchewan, named after Melville Hayes. He was the president of the Grand Trunk Pacific Railroad. He pushed for the railroad with the Grand Trunk Pacific in London, England. He also pushed to build Benaki Inn. Never saw either dream realized because April 15, 1912, he was body number 307, the sinking of the Titanic. Yeah, he was, he was incredible. I could do a whole series just on, on Hayes, an incredible guy. Um, and uh, Sir Henry Thornton then took over the railroad and, and moved on from there. That's so again, here's the, the development. Uh, this is the Menaki Inn uh, looking south. 
It, um, it was built in sequence of other Grand Trunk Pacific hotels across the country and, and in competition with the CP rail hotels, such as the Ben Springs. First was the Chateau Laurier in 1912 in, in Ottawa, Hotel Fort Garry in Winnipeg in 13, Mackey Inn in 14, then the Mac in, in Edmonton in 15. Jasper Park started as a tent city, a tent camp in 1915. Then the original Jasper Park was built in 1922. And then it burned down in 52 or 53. So a very heady company that the Menaki Inn was in. It was, it was a huge uh, resort. It was built as the largest summer resort in Canada at the time. And if you go on the web, you can look at a hotel that was modeled after. It's called the Wawa Hotel in Muskokus. And it was built by the Grand Trunk in 1908. It burned down in 23. So they, they couldn't get this right with keeping these hotels <laughs> standing. Unfortunately, when the Wawa burned down, there was eight casualties that happened in August. So the building was built between 1913 and 1914. It was a city block long, so it faced the water. Three stories tall, could accommodate 300 guests. And we don't have any colorized pictures, but uh, through reports of the Manitoba Free Press, we know the outside was red and gray in color. Um, it had, a few, I won't go through the whole list, but it had a few things that it, were very leading edge in 1913, 1914. They had double doors between rooms for soundproofing. The hotels here don't do it now. Um, they had a um, second floor, which had a second veranda on top. There's, there's multiple verandas all around the building. It reported that it looked out from the veranda over the Winnipeg River and the Laurentian Hills. I think the reporter was a little geographically challenged that day. Or it was written late in the afternoon after, you know, whatever. They had card room, they had a billiards room, um, electricity throughout, dark room for amateur photographers so they can go in and have your pictures developed. And on the, um, we'll see it in a minute, uh, they had a screened-in reading room uh, out on an island where you could have your tea served at the reading room. Mr. Cream was the very first uh, manager, and it was managed by the Canadian Railway News Company on behalf of the Grand Trunk Pacific Nancy. So here's a picture of the, old, the boathouse. It stayed around until the late 50s, early 60s. And uh, we think that might be the Kathleen. It was one of the, boat, the steamboats that were up and down trip was three dollars return and the average trip was to right Bay from an Aki was two hours each way. Other boats that, came, that uh, roamed up and down were the Rambler, the Manaki, Skipper Holtz had his own boat that's at to Holtz Point Lodge and later Manaki Lodge had two big launches that used to come to their docks at right out and I was talking to somebody earlier and remembers the Iris H. Yeah, and uh, we've actually got from the library, and uh, Braden copied it for me, a copy of a ticket from the Iris Age, which is great to have. And obviously the boathouse and then the um, dance hall was above. And you'll notice in all these early pictures, there's no outboard motors and really invented that. Okay, Nancy. Here's the genteel sitting on the porch, sitting on the veranda, the launches at the dock in 1915. World War I was raging. It's ironic, they, they, it's incredible the dichotomy. In 1917, 18, and 19, during the war and for the first year after, only the lodge building, which is what we call the chalet or building H, uh, was open uh, during those periods. And somebody mentioned earlier about uh, concerts and, and raising money for Red Cross, five bucks or something. During the war, they used to have patriotic concerts. Orchestras would come down by train from Winnipeg. My great-grandmother, Werner, who sang Westminster United, would sing in these concerts, and one concert raised $100 for the Red Cross. And it was an incredible evening. Opinions. So here's a great picture. Uh, is Bob McNally here? Yeah. No, he didn't yeah, make yes, it. Okay. Yes, oh, yes. Bobby, you're here? I'm over here. Oh, hi, Bob. Thanks for coming. This picture is historic, and I want, the reason I want to mention with Bob, uh, this was probably taken, the last picture taken of the inn before it burnt down. The reason we know that is because the golf course has been built between uh, 24 and 25. You'll see that raft, three raft logs being towed to the mill in uh, Simpson and Short 
uh, lumber mill and pistol. We think the tugboat operator is Bob's grand grandfather, Bob? Grandfather Bert, right? That's right, yeah. Yep. And he's hauling logs from Cut on Gun Lake. I think they took them all from our property on Big Island, actually, <laughs> what I remember. You had nice trees there, Gary. We had very nice white pines, buddy. That's right. And um, they were trying to get them to the mill in, in Pistol before the water levels went down in the spring because it's only about a four-foot deep uh, channel into Pistol Lake. The insight that you see there was picked for many different reasons. Bear in mind, it was only open July and August for the first de many decades. For its beauty and, select and suitability, the sunset views looking up the river, the prevailing westerly summer breezes, distance from the train noise and the soot from obviously the coal, good flowing river water so there was no stagnant water sitting there, and a good shoreline for docks and boating with a sand beach around in along the ninth fairway there. Yes. And close to my heart obviously is the golf course. Anybody recognize which? Hole this is. It's a, it's a par three. That's the seventh. Looks like that guy's probably about his fifth shot <laughs> going into the green. Railway is over on the on the left. You can see the telephone, and the telegraph wires. Stanley Thompson, world renowned uh, golf course architect in Toronto, uh, was hired to to design the golf course by CN. He picked the site on May the twenty fourth, nineteen twenty four. Work started immediately, soil was brought in. Now, this is one of the myths that I'll dispel right now. Everybody's heard that the, the soil was brought from Dougal, right? Yeah. No. Who said yes? <laughs> it was brought from Enola. I've actually talked to the grandson of Mr. Cook who sold the farm to sell the soil to the, grand, to the CN uh, Railroad. So the soil came in about 30 carloads over the nine, it's only nine hole golf course. And with 150 men and horses, they opened for a tournament on July the 4th, 1925. So within a year, they were up and running. The plan had been that, the, of course, the inn was going to open, but it burnt down. So they withheld the golf course opening for a couple of weeks until they got their feet under them. The first pro was a guy by the name of Ned McKenna. May not ring a bell with any of you. He went on to become a teaching pro at Oak Hill, which is one of the courses in the world, and his brother was a teaching pro at Oakmont. So it's pretty heavy stuff these guys came to Manaki. Uh, let's go to the next one, Nance. So here's, here it is. This is the, the image we all know. Uh, the building on the left that's facing lengthwise is Building H, which is the chalet. That was the only building left from 1914, and unfortunately it got torn down, I guess, when they did the renovations in 83. Um, two days after the Menaki Inn fire in 25, and armed with $200,000 of insurance money, the CN announced on June the 13th that the Menaki Inn would be rebuilt. Two weeks after the fire, the Lodge Chalet that I just mentioned was open for business and served 75 guests. The new lodge was well under construction by the end of 1925. By 1926, the chalet and then the cabins, remember the log cabins are all along the water. Um, they provided uh, housing for 140 people. It was designed by Mr. L.G. Briggs, who was, by the way, not an architect. Like me, he was an engineer. So engineers can design buildings too. <laughs> the loggers, well-known Swedish, they came, they built Jasper Park uh, Lodge before uh, Menaki, came to Menaki and then went on and built the largest standing wood structure, I guess, in North America, uh, Montebello, so in 1930-31. With this approval, and so, so on June the 17th, 1927, the new $250,000 Jewel of the North opened. With this approval from an interview with McLean's Magazine just after the 2003 fire, I quote fellow Menaki cottager and noted author Jake McDonald, quote, imagine brawny walls of log and rock, high medieval stained glass windows that turn gold and crimson in the setting sun, and a grand rotunda that soared up and up into the apex of iron chandeliers, massive chains, and marvelously interlaced timbers. 
countless articles and brochures and the odd storyteller has tried to articulate the spirit of the lodge, but you had to see it. Walking into the lodge for the first time, my guest, this is Jay talking, would always stop in the foyer, lift their eyes to the ceiling, and let out a gasp. <laughs> How could any advertising brochure capture that sound? And I get a little teary-eyed because the loss of this thing is core to, to our community. And, and I, thank you, Jake, for that. Um, next, Nance. Here's guests arriving by train. And, but I'm going to preface this by also saying it's not just guests. It's all the cottagers. As I mentioned earlier, Dr. Moore was talking about the Menachie Special, the, the cottagers, the, the uh, uh, camper special. We had a camper special. I grew up on it every weekend coming down to Menachie until the road came in in, in, in uh, 61. There was often four to 500 guests of cottagers would arrive Friday night on the Continental or on the, continent, on the camper special. Some even came by private train, or pri private car or private train. And we had two sidings so they could park and stay at the weekend. If you see, note the, the uh, horse-drawn uh, baggage carts, so the luggage was hauled overland through the golf course. And the guests would then, by the next slide, go down to the launches that were waiting. That's the main government docks, yeah, as it looked then, um, and first class service uh, to the front door of what was now the Menaki Lodge. One story is told of a honeymoon couple arriving at Menaki, and they were made to walk from the station over to the lodge. The reason being because the Menaki a uh, trio of musicians played Mendelssohn's Wedding March and took them overland playing this all the way. Very, very cool, very classic. So the next is a, is a great picture of the inside on the left, the dining room, many of you remember, the veranda before they ruined it by enclosing it. Um, this was um, from its opening in 14 through to the 50s was really the golden age of the lodge. Uh, it uh, was a time period that saw high style and elegance. And Sir Henry Thornton, who was the president during the time, actually did a renovation of the original Menachee Inn in 24, 25, and a facelift. It took great pride in entertaining European uh, business magnets. And it was only after the inn's renovations were completed, unfortunately never enjoyed, because it burnt down the day before it opened. But then he saw that uh, developed in the new lodge building. So imagine the new lodge reflecting a more prestigious image, meeting his expectations with orchestra music, Edwardian formality, maitre d' and tuxedo, Music from the orchestra above the boathouse wafting over the water. Afternoon tea on the front lawn, elegant with uniformed waitresses bringing out silver tea services and dainty sandwiches. And lodge guests and cottagers alike would arrive, the ladies wore dresses to dinner every night, the men wore dark blazers with white flannel slacks, except on Saturday nights when they wore white dinner jackets. And this picture of the veranda, we actually have at our cottage, and it's, it's a great reminder of what it looked like. Next, Vince. The entertainment uh, was varied and incredible over the many, many years of, of its history, and I will not go into the full list, but um, there's names of or orchestra leaders here that I don't know from the 20s and 30s, Don Steele, Bill Story. Uh, CKRC Radio used to have live orchestra from the lodge in the 20s and 30s, back to Winnipeg. Jimmy King, Marshminster, those are names you'll remember. Um, uh, Bob Cook, who played both here and at the lake for many, many years. Um, uh, Ted Komar, Andre Philip Gagnon were just some of the entertainers over the many years. One of the myths to dispel, and this, it happened during this period of time in 1938, they always say Menachee Lodge never made a profit. Well, on $1.1 million in revenue in 1938, the profit was $1,890. <laughs> now, I don't know what that returned in terms of the shareholders, what they got, like a two, two cent dividend, but they made a profit. That was pretty good. Okay, Nancy. 
This I won't go through in detail, but this is uh, 1934 and it's 36. A couple of the menus that we've gathered, and you can see more of them on our Facebook page. Fine dining, all obviously in the price of the room. Um, there's also talk here about Manaki lamb. I'm not sure where they were raised. We <laughs> got to slaughter them, but, uh, but and during the 30s, the only other year that the lodge was closed was 1933, depth of the, of the recession, the depression. Okay, Nancy. Here's some activities, uh, two in particular, aquaplaning. A boat's going probably about 10 miles an hour. Just, well, the height of it, at decadence. And, uh, uh, but obviously over the years, they, they've, the, the uh, activities have morphed to, to the, uh, the norms of society. Fishing's always been core. Um, I used to teach how to ride a moped to, to our customers, our clients. I couldn't ride one, but I would teach our clients. <laughs> Uh, heated swimming pools, both indoors and out. Fitness trails. Mount Manaki. Anyone ski at Mount Manaki? No? Yeah? 180 feet vertical. I mean, you know, Jasper's got nothing on it. <laughs> Cross country was very popular for many years. Sailing. Tennis. The, 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 the tennis courts, the first two that are there, um, actually were powdered clay and equivalent to what Wimbledon was playing on. It was, this was pretty high quality stuff back then. And somebody mentioned earlier, we were talking about bathing and swimming uh, when you all your so on. Once they put showers in the lodge, then all the advertising for the lodge changed the words from come and bathe at Manaki to come and swim at Manaki. <laughs> so you know, didn't have to wash in the lake. <laughs> or your story, Vince. Uh, here's some posters that uh, we've been able to gather. Uh, as I mentioned, it was open from 39 to 42. Um, closed completely due to wartime restrictions, 43, 44, 45. And, um, you know, golf, fishing, tennis, they were all staying open uh, during that time. And people could stay at Hulls Point and at Pala. But it was also a time of gas and food rationing. And also the wartime tax was on. Um, two quick things. Number one, boys are off fighting the war. What's happening in 1940 Benaki Lodge? The guests, and time is up, I understand. Thank you. I'm almost there. <laughs> Working on it at least. Um, they had a nudist camp. <laughs> they had a nudist camp. <laughs> I don't think we have any photos of that. <laughs> there was also, on the other side, there was a floating swimming pool in the lake, in the river, for children. So the water would wash through and the kids were safe and they were in this pool. I've talked to a lifeguard who worked there in 1940. The way he would clean the swimming pool is get the kids out, hopefully, took a 25 horsepower motor, put it on the edge of the floating swimming pool, started the motor up, drove the water through the pool and he got a squeegee up and was cleaning, up, cleaning all the slime off the, water, off the, uh, the wood slats. Next slide. Here's uh, obviously fishing. Uh, before some of the restrictions were put in. Uh, Ernie Walleye Simpson is on the left, one of the renowned uh, um, guides in the area. And this was at the time when the first transition of ownership from CN to AT Hotel started in early 1955. And uh, CN, when they housed at the hotel, they used to move their staff around the country to different hotels. And then in the winter, they'd move into Often many of them would work at the Hotel Fort Gary in Winnipeg in the winter and then come back out work in the summer. Cool. Okay, Nancy. Uh, 61 was the arrival of the road. A uh, great place for us to work as kids um, uh, over the years. Sorry? Oh. Um, okay, next. Later years, um, we've got to say more and more that we're gathering these brochures. I've also been able to talk to a lot of the old managers who are still around and collecting information. Many ownership changes over the years. I won't go into them right now in detail. Um, not all positive, and uh, unfortunately, the, not not all of them um, uh, stay around very long. But there's an a, there's an an important event at Manaki Lodge that I want to mention. One of the most significant events, and that was in August the sixth, nineteen nineteen ninety three, at a meeting of the National Native Convocation of Indigenous Anglicans. At that meeting, the primate of the Anglican Church of Canada. Archbishop Michael Pierce stood up 
in front of over 100 gathered, and in a very moving and from memory speech, and I'm not good at memory speeches, provided the first Anglican church apology in public for its years-long involvement in the residential schools program. So it was a signature event on behalf of the Anglican church. Um, on August 7th, the apology was accepted at that conference, so fascinating. Um, two other things happened in the 70s. One was um, Mercury, obviously, more the Wabagoon than the Winnipeg, but we got painted with it as well. And fortunately, we had a couple of big auctions in the 70s and 80s at, at the Lodge. And by that happening, a lot of the artifacts that have been dispersed to people around the lake, and so they've been saved as opposed to losing them in the fire. Thanks. Nothing more to say. That's Thanksgiving morning, October 12th, 2003. I was driving to work Monday morning, or Tuesday morning. I'd been away and uh, just about drove off the road. Okay, Nancy, I'm not going to end another one. I, the end of an era there. You know, so sad. Okay. Um, what was interesting is the 1925 fire at the end happened uh, in the evening before they opened. And the reason it really happened was because they had set everything up, they getting everything open, getting everything renovated, they put in a new hydrant fire protection system around the, the inn. Fire started, but there was a section of pipe about eight feet long that was to connect the hydrants to the water supply, and it was sitting at the CN station in Menaki. Hadn't been plugged in yet. So, gone. So, the, the, the lodge on the left uh, learned a lot from that, obviously, in terms of building single story, building of, of, of log, harder to, to incinerate quickly. Um, the existing hydrant system was then connected to high pressure water. Uh, the buildings were built apart, the, lo the cabins, to prevent the spread of flame. Uh, alarm boxes. Hourly watchmen walking around the site, fire hoses at every hydrant, 50,000 gallon water tank, and then in the 70s they put in sprinkler system, fire alarm system, lightning protection system, replaced the floor of the kitchen, all to no avail in 2003. So, uh, last, that is the last photo. So, in closing, um, we hope we've whet your appetite to more details. Um, it's a fascinating story. It's a sad story, but there's, there's some hope. Please look at our, our Facebook page for great images. Check out our ad in the current area news. I put an ad in the other day, or it was issued the other day. And we're going to have a website coming up very shortly. Please see Nancy and I with your email addresses, or for our email addresses, if you want to correspond, provide information um, uh, that you wish to share. It's been my honor to prevent, present this Menaki Lodge story, even if we've only hit some of the highs and a few of the lows. My thanks to Nancy for all her hard work. She put all the slides together. And for, to both my ladies for putting up with me. There is, there is so much more to tell, and we would love to be involved again in this magnificent event. The loss of the Lodge, along with the loss of Holtz Point 14 years earlier, has torn at the core and the fabric of our Menaki community, but it is still vibrant and strong in many respects. Menaki is not just the lodge, but tourism drives the financial base of Menaki. Again, in the words of Jake McDonald, Menaki Lodge, I'm like Dr. Warren when he gets towards the end, I start to tear up a bit. Menaki Lodge glowed like a giant Tiffany lamp above the water. Rebuild it, it can never be replaced. And now it's a part of history. Thank you, big witch. <laughs>